Hello, and welcome to your stats warm up. So, what do we have here? Pictured below is quite possibly the world's most boring cumulative relative frequency graph. It shows the lifetime in hours of 200 lamps. All right, so remember the cumulative relative frequency graph is a way of visually representing percentiles. All right, so we can use this to find percentiles and we can use this to figure out what values correspond to specific percentiles. So the first question says, what value corresponds to the 60th percentile of this distribution? So with these graphs, the percentiles are always on the vertical axis. The values are always on the horizontal axis. So they're giving us the 60th percentile. So we would go to 60% on the vertical axis. We would try to be as straight as possible and even better have a ruler. Um, but we go over until we hit the graph. All right, when we hit the graph, we then go down. All right, where we hit on this axis tells us the value that corresponds to the 60th percentile. Now, again, it's all a matter of like, are your lines straight? Did you get the, you know, how accurate were you? When I'm grading these, I'm just going to be basing it off of your lines. As long as I see you're drawing the line correctly and drawing it down correctly, that's what I'm going to look for. I'm not going to say like, oh, technically it should have been here and their line was here because they didn't draw perfectly straight. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to look at your line and as long as your answers make sense based on the lines you drew, you're going to be good. So for this one, again, depending on how you drew your lines, you're probably somewhere in like the 950 to like 1000 hours range. You might be a little higher, you might be a little lower. Again, I'm more focused on, do you know how to draw the lines? Do you understand how to read one of these graphs? What is the percentile for a lamp that lasted 900 hours? So this is us going in the other direction, all right? So here we would start at the 900 and go up. When we hit the graph, then we go over and we read the percentile that way. So again, I don't think my lines are perfectly straight, but you're probably somewhere in like the 38 percentile, all right? Again, if you're a little higher, if you're a little lower, I'm just gonna base it off the lines that you drew, all right? But again, if they give you the value, you're going up and then to the left. If they give you the percentile, you're going to the right and then down. All right, next one. Larry came home from his doctor appointment beaming. The doctor told him that his blood pressure is at the 90th percentile for men his age. Larry figures that means he's better off than 90% of similar men. Is Larry right or is Larry dumb? Explain your answer. Unfortunately, in this case, Larry, let's just say, is misinformed. All right, we'll be polite. 90th percentile implies that 90% of men his age have lower blood pressure. which means Larry probably has high blood pressure. So Larry's blood pressure is probably really high. All right. So the key here is just knowing the definition of percentile and a percentile is the percent below an observation, all right? So you have to make sure that you're aware of that. And again, we have said that 
Technically, it can be less than or equal to, but in this class, to stay consistent, we're always going to do less than an observation. All right. So when I'm assessing you, I'm going to be assessing you on the less than definition, not the less than or equal to. All right. Each year, about 1.5 million college bound high school juniors take the PSAT. In a recent year, the mean score on the critical reading was 46.9 with a standard deviation of 10.9. At a local school, the mean was 50.2 with a standard deviation of 3.2. So a higher mean, but also less spread out. Joey Joe Jovison attended the school and scored a 52. Using Z-scores, does Joey look smarter by comparing himself to all juniors or just juniors in his school? All right, so this is kind of what we discussed, and this is one of the benefits of z-scores is that they allow you to compare against different distributions because we take into account the center of the two different distributions and we take into account the spread of those two different distributions and together that lets us compare things that are potentially involved with different groups so first things first you have to know the z-score formula so a z-score is the observation minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. All right. So the observation would be Joey's score. So again, we have, I'm going to put all here for this is all juniors. So in the all junior calculation, Z equals the 52 that Joey scored minus the national mean of 46.9 divided by the national standard deviation of 10.9, which when we work that out, 52 minus 46.9 divided by 10.9, uh, gives us like 4.678, but I'm just going to round that to 0.47. So that's basically almost... half a standard deviation above the mean. And again, remember, standard deviation isn't a unit the way like centimeters or feet is a unit. Um, it's, but it's a measure of like, based on how spread out this distribution is, it's half a standard deviation, which for this group is 10.9 above the mean. All right, and then if we do the same thing for the local, all right, we've got Z equals, again, the observation hasn't changed, but what has changed is the mean, which is now 50.2, and the standard deviation, which is now 3.2. So 52 minus 50.2 is gonna be 1.8. And then if we divide that by 3.2, all right, we end up with point, again, it's 5625, but I'm just going to say 0.56. So this is a little more than half a standard deviation above the mean. All right, so this is why it's important to consider not only the mean of a distribution, but the spread. If you only considered the mean, you would say, oh, wow, like he was, you know, 5.1 above the mean here. He was only 1.8 above the mean here. Clearly he wants to compare himself to the, the nation at large. But when you consider that that data is more spread out, it actually makes his score less impressive. Right? His score is more impressive when he's compared to just his school because everything is really condensed there than it is when he compares it to the nation as a whole because things are more spread out. All right, So it can sometimes give you this non-intuitive result, but that's why it's important that we take into account both the mean and the standard deviation. All right, let's take a look at the back here. Depending on your opinion of baseball, the dot pot below may or may not be more dull than the graph on lamps. It shows salaries for players on the 2008 Phillies. 
All right. So a pitcher by the name of Brad Lidge, who is now an announcer, um, made $6.35 million in 2008. What percentile corresponds to this salary? Explain what this value actually means. All right. So again, percentile is the percent below. So you'd have to start by identifying where Mr. Lidge falls on our graph here. So it's 6.35. That right there is probably Brad Lidge. And then the percentile is the percent below. So I'm not going to count his dot. I'm just going to count the dots below. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, and then there's 12 in that last column. So there are 22 dots below Brad there. And it tells us, well, it didn't tell us in the problem, but it tells us right here, N is always your sample size. It tells us there are 29 dots in total, if you don't feel like counting. So we've got 22 over 29 which works out to be 0.7586. So I'll write this as 0.7586, which you could also think as 75.86%, or you could think of that as the 75th 0.86th percentile. All right, I'm fine with any of those three, one is not going to get you more points than the other. All right. This is okay. This is okay. This is okay. Whatever way you want to give it to me is fine by me. What does that mean? It means that roughly 76% of the team makes less money. than Brad. All right, Brad and I are on a first name basis. All right, but this again is the percentile, so it's the percent below the observation. So again, it's knowing that definition and then knowing that you don't count that dot as part of your calculation. All right, next, find the Z-score for Lidge's salary. So again, Z equals observation minus mean divided by standard deviation. The observation is Brad's salary, so 635000. The mean we can get right here, so that's 3388617. And the standard deviation we can get right here, so that's 3767488. Four. All right. And then once you have those numbers, let me just type them in here. 6350000 minus 3388617 divided by 37674844. We end up with 0. 0.7860. All right, so what does this value mean? It means that Brad's salary is 0 0.7860 standard deviations above the mean. And again, standard deviations for this group one standard deviation is, you know, 3.7 million or something. So it's, it's basically 78, 79% of this value above the mean. All right, let's see here. Another pitcher, Ryan Matson, made 1.4 million. All right. Did he have a high or low salary? compared to the rest of the team, justify your answer using his Z-score and percentile. All right, so again, we're going back to our graph. If this right here, the center line is a million, I'm gonna say that this one right here is probably 
our good friend Ryan Madsen. All right, so that's our 1.4 million. So again, there's 12 dots in this line. There's two more there. So the percentile would just be 14 out of 29, which is 0.4828. Or you can write that as 48.28% or you can write it as the 48.28th percentile. Right. So that's saying, you know, 48, but basically roughly 50% of the team is below Ryan there. So that makes you think that Ryan's pretty much right in the middle of the team. All right, now let's see what his Z-score says. So his Z-score would be 1,400,000 minus the mean, which we saw was 3,388,617 divided by the standard deviation, which was 3,767,482. So if we type those numbers in and we work that out, first thing we can notice is that his salary is below the mean. So we are going to get a negative number here, and that's totally fine when you're dealing with z-scores. A negative number just implies that you're below the mean, and a positive number is that you're above the mean. So here we've got point, negative point, five, two, seven, eight. So this is basically, you know, this is roughly half a standard deviation, roughly half a standard deviation below the mean, right? Because the negative implies that it's below. So we've kind of got two conflicting results here. This one says, yeah, it's basically right in the middle. And this one says, actually, no, you're like half a standard deviation below the mean, which kind of means you're, you're, you're subpar there. Um, so what's going on here and, and which one is the more accurate measurement? So remember that the Z-score reply, reply, eh, relies on the mean and the standard deviation, right? Here, we have a skewed distribution. Right? We learned in the last unit that when you have a skewed distribution, you want to stay away from the mean and the standard deviation because they are greatly impacted by outliers. And this right here looks a lot like an outlier to me. So, you know, Z-score is a poor choice here. All right. So when we're explaining what happens here, you know, I would say... Ryan's salary is right near the center of the distribution. The percentile is a more accurate indicator of Ryan's position. Because remember, that's what both of these are telling us about. They're telling us about where data falls in a distribution. So, um, because the distribution is skewed right making the z-score unreliable All right, so 
this is kind of unit one information influencing how we think about information in unit two and saying to ourselves, okay, I know that when something is skewed, these two numbers are not reliable. So I need to stick with this calculation up here if I'm describing where somebody falls in a distribution due to the shape that I can see from my dot plot up here. All right. So I hope this was helpful. Best of luck. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye.